Guys, welcome to the third lecture on TensorFlow for Deep Learning Research. Again, we are going to be following the slides from CS20SI, which is the class which is being offered at Stanford this quarter. Thanks a lot to Stanford and to Chip for making the slides available to the public. So today, this is where the rubber meets the road. So we have uh, gone through some material in TensorFlow and today we are going to start writing some basic models. So as we talked about in the previous lectures, in TensorFlow, we separate the definition of the computation graph from the execution of the computation graph. So in the first stage, we will be assembling a graph, adding various ops to it. And then we are going to create a session and we are going to execute the various ops in the graph. So we covered all this in the last lectures. So we all are hopefully very familiar with this picture right now where when we are trying to run Z out here and uh, if Z does not depend on this node useless, then that is not going to get uh, calculated. And you can visualize everything in TensorBoard by creating file writer objects. So again, this is a very brief review. We have gone through all this in the last lectures. TF constants, they get stored, the values get stored in the graph and if and that can cause the graph to get bloated. So we try to we want to try and minimize that. Whereas the if we were declaring variables, the sessions, when we declare a session, the session will allocate the memory that is required to store the values of the variable. And placeholders are ops on the graph where when we do a session.run, we have to feed in the values at that time. Now, we also talked about how variables are feedable also. So you can query the graph for whether a tensor is feedable or not. And if it is feedable, you can put in the values during the call to session.run. Now, for placeholders, you have to do that. For variables, you can do that if needed. And that can be very useful for testing. We also talked about avoiding lazy loading. We want to absolutely make sure that uh, we come up with, we separate the assembling of the graph and uh, executing ops. So for example, for training, you would want to you want to come up with a training op which has optimizer.minimize loss and you want to put it in the graph. And when you're calling session.run, you want to be calling that um, training op, not putting the definition within the session.run. We talked about that. And uh, you can also use uh, Python properties to ensure that the function also gets loaded only once. So this is also something we talked about exactly how to do with an example in the previous lecture. So for this lecture, this is a workshop. So I would highly, highly recommend that you actually go to the GitHub site for the class and uh, clone the, uh, clone the repo and go to these various examples. So what I'm going to do is to, I'm going to just go through the solution and uh, we can talk about it very, very in, in a lot of detail. But uh, at this point, I would highly recommend that you actually try to follow the slides along and uh, actually go ahead and solve the problem. So the first example, we are uh, going to be using uh, linear regression. So in linear regression, we have a dependent variable y and uh, we can have uh, any number of uh, independent variables, right? And y is going to be a scalar value. It can be 2.0, 1950, 2.63, whatever. But it's, uh, it's on the real axis, it's a scalar value. And what you're trying to do is to come up with a prediction for y based on some variables x. So in the example that we are going to be covering, the data set has the independent variable as the number of incidents of fire, 
and uh, the dependent variable is the number of incidents of theft. And we are trying to see if there is a relationship between the number of incidents of fire and the number of incidents of theft. So here you go, you want to predict y from x. And we are going to be using a very simple model. The model is a linear model where we are going to be multiplying x by w, adding a bias term, and that will give us a prediction. So the model right there is the predicted value of y is w multiplied by x plus b, right? And uh, second line out here, y minus y predicted square is the loss. So the way you would do the training is you will come up with a prediction, you will calculate the loss, and you will try to minimize the loss, which in TensorFlow, what it should do is it will muck around with the values of these variables, which are the trainable variables, w and b, and it's going to try and keep on making y and y predicted as close as possible. So with this, we are going to move to the actual code and then we'll follow that through. Okay, so here's the code for the linear regression example. So out here, what we are given is a data set where there is an input x, which is the number of fires, and an output target variable y, which is the number of thefts. And we are trying to figure out whether there is a correlation between the two. And the way you do that, if you're trying to figure out a scalar number, you would use uh, linear regression, right? So the very first step, you want to read in the data, which has already been done out here. Uh, we are opening up the Excel workbook. And uh, by the end of this, we have number of samples. There are 42. And we have the data, which has uh, this format where it's a list of tuples. The x variable is 6.2, the number of thefts out here, 29, etc. for 42 samples, right? And then what we do is we create placeholders for the input x and y. And uh, I'm running this in debug mode so that uh, we can take a look at the variables as to and get a better idea as to what's happening out there. So x out here is, uh, it's a tensor, okay? And uh, it's basically, there is a graph associated with it, and that would be the default graph, which you can see out here. Similarly with y, the same thing happens. There is a graph associated, but nothing is really happening. We are just uh, creating, adding ops to the graph here. The, there is a w because the model, as we talked about, is going to be y is equal to w x plus b. So w is the variable, and we are going to be training that, and b is the bias. We are initializing w to 0, and this is probably the last time you'll see a va variable, the weights, uh, initialized to 0. So because there's a whole science behind how to initialize them so that the model converges faster. Uh, this is a bias. We come up with our prediction, which is the model. The entire model is this step four. Y predicted is equal to X into W plus B. Again, this is also a tensor. And the name is uh, the default name, which is add out here. The next step is we use, uh, we come up with a loss function. And for linear regression, one of the loss functions that we use is uh, just a square error. And we can later talk about the merits, uh, pros and cons of doing that. But here we are just using the basic loss, uh, the square error as the loss function. And we define an optimizer. We are going with the gradient descent optimizer with a learning rate of 0 0.001. And the op is, the, the training op is to minimize loss. So gradient descent optimizer dot minimize loss. Now, so at this point, we have our graph set. We have the data read in. We have initialized, uh, created placeholders 
created our variables weight and bias we have created the model which gives us a prediction and we have come up with a loss which takes that prediction and the real value which is y out here which is the placeholder and uh, we have come up with a way uh, with a op for minimizing that loss so we are set out here now what we do is we instantiate a session the first thing we do out here is to go ahead and run the session and uh, uh, run the session for and within that the first op we give is the global variables initializer so that all our variables which are wb they get initialized to their respective values which are zero in this case we want to write events to our tensor board so we will instantiate a tf.summary.file writer put it put the place where we want to write those events and pass in the graph and we want to run the train the model 100 times okay so we take the for and there are 100 epochs so what an epoch means that you are going over the entire data set once that's going to be one epoch right so we are going to be running 100 epochs and uh, for uh, we, are, we are iterating through the data and we are repeatedly calling session.run on the training op right and we are outputting the loss and the optimizer which we are not really which we don't care about and each step when we are doing the session.run we are feeding in one value of x and y right so this loop will run 42 times and then for going through the entire epoch and then the outside loop will run another 100 times and then we are going to and for each of these runs what's going to happen is tensorflow is going to call the op it will go ahead and optimize uh, minimize the loss so after this line is called tensorflow is going to look at all the variables which are which are which loss is dependent on and it's going to update them in a direction that minimizes the loss right so if you run it multiple multiple times hopefully it finds a uh, it finds its uh, minimum at the end of it we do a writer dot close and uh, now we then we go ahead and get a handle on the w and b by calling ses dot run on w comma b now this as we talked about in an earlier lecture that this is the way that you are actually going to get the value of um, w and b from from the graph into python into numpy land and out here we are now once we have w and b at this point we have full predictability in the sense that given any random value of x we are going to be able to give an estimate for y so out here we are going to be going and plotting x and y based on whatever data we have and this is where we are going to see the plot okay so these are the various steps that we already talked about so i'm just going to very quickly go through them okay and if we were to visualize the tensor board well this is what's going to show up and we are going to see that the gradient descent is going to be dependent on weights gradients by so these are the things it's going to try and update okay gradients in in turn is dependent on like bias weights it's part of the same graph and once we plot the results this is what we see so now what we are seeing is this is the predicted line which is the best way that this particular model has found to fit this data to minimize the square error right but we see some certain things interesting out here that there is this uh, uh, point which is way out there it's an outlier and uh, it seems to be pulling the this line up towards it and uh, we'll talk about it so 
the way TensorFlow knows what variables to update is uh, when we call this run, again, it's just going to go look at everything that the loss is dependent on. So it's going to find the trainable variables, so variables which have the trainable uh, parameter turned to true, and it's going to find all of these variables in the graph, and it's going to try and update them to minimize the loss. So that's what it does in a, in a loop, right? And there are tons of optimizers, and there is, again, a whole theory behind it as to what optimizers to use. But some of the optimizers that I have used with uh, success, Gradient Descent, uh, Adagrad, Momentum, Adam, uh, these four I have used. I have never used Proximal Gradient or Proximal Adagrad. And uh, I have also used RMS Prop Optimizer. Now, one of the interesting things about RMS Prop Optimizer is that this came about, the very first public reveal of this optimizer was in a Coursera class by Jeffrey Hinton. So that was the very first time when the community found out about the RMS Prop, but that's also a very useful optimizer. So how do we know that our model is correct and how to improve our model, right? The way you would in any, and this is this goes beyond TensorFlow or deep learning. In any machine learning scenario, the way we know that the model is good is when we actually test it on data that the model has not seen before, right? The entire idea of any model is not to fit to the data that we have, but the whole idea is that we have some data, we find, want to find a model that's going to generalize. So that's the whole idea that uh, to figure out that the model is correct, we would need additional data, and we want to see that the model performs well with, within that context. So how do we improve this? So one of the things with uh, the square error is that it is very, it is very sensitive to outliers because uh, we are trying to minimize the square, right? So, it, for example, this point, right? There is this huge distance between the line and between where this current line is and where the point is. So, the whole, this, the square of this is going to be pretty significant, right? And uh, so, the model is going to try and pay a lot of attention and move towards outliers. So we want something that is going to be less sensitive to outliers and uh, the loss uh, function that we use in that case is Huber loss, right? So the intuition out here is uh, pretty simple that if uh, in our training set, we find that uh, while we are training, if the prediction that we are at that point, so in, remember that the model is running in a loop uh, for training and at every point there is a certain value of W, there is a certain value of B, so at any point we are calculating those Y predictions, right? So if we, and we also have by definition the, the actual label during the training uh, training the supervised setting where we have the training examples. So at any point when we see that the Y predicted and the uh, Y, which is the real label, when it's a, which, which is, if it is less than a certain delta, then we will use this squared uh, function, okay? But if it is greater than delta, then we are just going to use the absolute difference between the two. Right, and then there is this uh, one uh, one element which is just a square of the delta. So it should. So what would happen in a case like with that outlier is that when this value is very large, we are not going to be squaring it. We are just going to uh, take the absolute value of the difference, and so it's not going to be that sensitive. Now, how do we code this up in TensorFlow? because uh, we, are, we need to add ops in the graph. And uh, as of the current release of TensorFlow, we, can, we still cannot just put in an if statement. We cannot put in a conditional in this way, but uh, 
what we can do is we can define this function Huber loss and uh, any loss function will take the predictions and the labels and the delta that we talked about let's uh, say the initial value the default value is 1.0 so we will find the residual which is the difference between uh, the predictions and the labels using tf.abs right now uh, the conditional instead of if there is an actual tf.less function which is true if residual is less than delta so condition is equal to tf.less residual comma delta and um, if the residual is small we are in this land where we have this function 0 0.5 into tf dot square residual and if it is large we have this function delta into residual minus 0 0.5 tf dot square delta and then we are going to be using this op tf dot select on the condition so if the condition is true which is if the residual is less than delta if the uh, that's it's going to be true when the residual is less than delta this tf dot less function re returns true then we are going to be returning the small res which is the top one otherwise if it's false we are going to be returning large res so this is how you're going to be implementing the huber loss and uh, the good thing, am amazing thing about any of these uh, deep learning frameworks is once you define this and you call this the you don't have to worry about the writing the back propagation uh, by hand you don't have to worry about writing the the backward functions by hand and um, the only way you get that for free is if you're using these ops and uh, for each of these ops tensorflow library will already have written the back prop so uh, that's pretty pretty useful okay and now we are going to go into logistic regression. So we'll look at the MNIST database. So if you are, you have been working with machine learning or deep learning, you are probably all already sick of looking at this database because uh, for a lot of the problems, this is a database that we, we look at as uh, some of the initial, when we are building some of the initial models. So what this database has is like a bunch of these 28 by 28 images. Right. And um, we, it's a label data set. So the, these are the digits zero to nine. And each image is all the training set is labeled with uh, this uh, label zero to nine. And um, the whole idea is that uh, we'll be training on this and then we'll be trying to create a model which can take it an image and predict what digit it is. OK, so this so this this is this task is a classification task it's not the regression task that we looked at earlier out here we will be our prediction is going to be one of ten, one of 10 classes so the model that we use in case of uh, classification for this they will, we are going to start with a basic linear model and it's uh, the basic logistic regression where you calculate the logits as simply x into w plus b the same as what we did for regression where we were doing something similar but the prediction is going to be a softmax on the logits so what the softmax function is going to do is to squish everything into a probability distribution okay and uh, whenever we use softmax the loss function that we use is a cross entropy loss function and you can uh, look at it it's um, it shows you the distance between two probability distributions and it's uh, uh, minus p1 log q1 where p and q are the uh, probability values and then you sum it over all the values okay so the it's and this might be a little bit confusing in the sense that okay why predicted okay we just talked about softness logic so we are getting a, we are getting a probability distribution so that makes sense to put y predicted out here but uh, what about y why is why are just the labels for our training sets so the way it works is y is going to be one hot encoded so what that means is we'll have a vector of 10 
and one of the digits is going to be one based on whatever that class is and everything else is zero. So if you look at it, summation over all the classes is going to trivially turn out to be one and this can be treated as a probability distribution. So that's why we are able to use Y within the cross entropy function. And also we are going to be batching things up. So in deep learning in general, whenever you are calling the session dot run training operation, you're not going to be sending just one image or one training datum. You are going to be sending a batch of that because uh, you want to make uh, good use of, uh, first of all, if you're using GPUs, you want to make good use of the GPU memories. And also this, the, the whole idea is out here, we are trying to do a mini batch uh, stochastic gradient descent. So if you, the, if you were to go and do the full batch, uh, full uh, gradient descent, you would want to use the entire training set as a batch. But since we cannot do that, we use a smaller batch size and uh, it can be whatever. It can be uh, 632, 64, 128. That depends on the size of your, the memory that's available to you. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the code out here. And uh, what we are doing out here is uh, we are defining some parameters, learning rate, the batch size in this case is 128. And we are going to be uh, running 30 epochs. So one epoch again is when you go through the entire data set, the entire training set, that's one epoch. And we want to go do it uh, multiple times. So we are doing it for 30 times in this case. The first uh, line is just uh, the reading in data. That's always the step one. And uh, the MNIST uh, already comes up with this uh, API to read data in and at the end of this we would already have the training set, uh, the val validation set and the test set already nicely set out. And uh, we have the one, one hot is equal to true, that's what we just discussed. So we read in data, now we want to create the placeholders for the models. So we are going to be the tf.placeholder, the type of, uh, the type would be tf.float32. And the shape is, we are going to use batch size and 784. So 784 is 28 square, which is the size of that image. And we are going to be reshaping it into one, uh, uh, into a 1D array of 784 elements. Uh, we give it a name. Similarly with y, y should be, uh, batch size and it's 10 and uh, placeholder, okay? The, as soon as we are done with that, we, are, we want to be creating the weights and biases. So for the model, we need a wtf.variable and uh, the shape is uh, going to be dependent on whatever the input shape is and whatever the output number of classes are, okay? So we want to take a 784 vector to a 10 vector. So the shape out here is going to be 784 comma 10. And we are going to be initializing the init initializer function we are giving out here is tf.random normal st standard dev of 0 0.01 and uh, the bias is going to depend on the number of classes that we are going to. So that's, we are going to initialize with tf.0s, one comma 10. So regarding the shapes of W and B, one thing that uh, is useful to remember that uh, even if it's multi-layer uh, multi network, you are going for whenever you're trying to create the tf.variable uh, for the weights, you will look at the, the last in at the input uh, feature dimension which is 784 in this case to what it is going to and the bias is going to be 1 comma 10 and the way it works is if you multiply x by w you are going to get batch size comma 10 as the as the output and now you want to be so the the 10 classes are the dimensionality of the row and you want to be adding a bias value to each one of them so that bias also needs to be a row 
and it's going to be 1 comma 10 and it's uh, and our tensorflow is going to take care of broadcasting it over the entire batch okay so that is just the only little thing that you have to be careful about and once you write a few models it will become second nature the model out here is very simple tf.matmul x comma w plus b so again this x comma w will uh, go ahead and take the uh, dimensionality to batch size comma 10 right and uh, we are going to be adding uh, the bias everywhere so the logits are going to be the batch size uh, into 10 that's the that's going to be the dimensionality out here now the loss function that we use if we want to use softmax is uh, the cross entropy and this is something that is that comes inbuilt so we can directly calculate entropy is equal to tf dot nn dot softmax underscore cross entropy with logits. You provide the logits and the actual value because that's how we calculate the loss, the predictions and the actual value that is going to be input. And uh, remember, this is also going to be uh, at the end of it. This is going to be a uh, batch size by one. So there is going to be a column vector right which is the the call the size of the column is uh, batch size and uh, there is going to be a number or a scalar at each of these uh, uh, elements and uh, to come up with one value of loss you are going to do the reduce mean on that on entropy which is going to squish everything into one scalar okay so this is the mean over all the examples now we got the loss in step 5 now we define an optimizer, tf.train.gradient descent optimizer is going to give us a handle on the optimizer and we call the training function uh, minimize loss. So we are done from a graph creation perspective at this point and uh, once we call, we, we are going to instantiate a session, uh, let's go ahead and uh, write everything in uh, uh, for TensorBoard we are going to initialize all the variables uh, using tf.global underscore variables underscore initializer and uh, these are the number of batches that we will have in one epoch and uh, for each of these epochs we are going to go and uh, get the uh, batch for the training data and the uh, labels feed them into session.run optimizer comma loss and uh, we are going to do the feed deck out here this this is all very standard fare from this point on and we let the model train okay now once we finish the training we want to test the model to see how it is doing and uh, what we do out there is we look at the the text, uh, the test examples, and uh, we see how many batches uh, get formed by dividing them by byte size. Now, we, what we are going to do is to find the total number of correct predictions. Okay, and the way we do this is uh, we go through the uh, x, we find we get a next batch, x batch, y batch, and um, we are going to the only thing we need out here is the logit so in the code that is um, given at stanford uh, by the in in the tf stanford tutorials website we are calling the optimizer also typically this is something you would not do because it's actually illustrative so if we do that if we run the optimizer then what we are effectively doing is uh, now we are feeding in the batch x batch and the and the labeled uh, y batch which is part of the test set okay and we are optimizing on that so that's going to actually overfit our test set so that's not something we want to typically do what we want to do is not even call the optimizer the only thing we need for finding the predictions is logit so let's assume we we just call the logits and we put that in logits batch now when we call the softmax on the logits batch we are going to get the probability so uh, here the variable name i think if we had uh, called it probs probabilities that would have been better so let's assume it's probs um, tf.n in softmax logits batch 
Now the correct predictions are these uh, this probabilities p, uh, probs comma one and tf dot argmax of that. So if you imagine the probs being a matrix of batch size multiplied by 10. So each of these 10 numbers in each row is the probability of the uh, particular class. Then tf.argmax is going to be, uh, on especially when, when it's called on the argument one, which is the column argument, it's going to come up with an integer value. It's going to give you an index of which of these places the max occurs. So if it is, uh, if five is the digit and it is correctly recognized, then it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four. The index of five is going to be four. So this value is going to be an integer four. And similarly for tf.rmx y by y batch one. And uh, so that's going to get compared and we are going to have tf.equal. So it's going to see whether or not these two are equal. So it will be true or false. So at the end of this operation, correct preds is going to be uh, a vector which is of size, batch size, and it's, it will have one element each which shows true or false, whether or not that prediction was correct or not. And um, uh, accuracy, uh, the way it is being computed out here, it's not really accuracy, it's the number of correct predictions. So let's say uh, we assume this variable to be number of correct predictions is the tf.reduce sum. Uh, and this is just a matter of adding up all the true values in that vector that we just talked about. And since uh, these are booleans, we need to change them into tf float. Uh, and we'll get that uh, number and we keep on adding the uh, and we keep on adding this uh, number to the total correct predictions that we initialize at zero so this is what you'll get at the end of it we take that number divide by the total number of text test examples and that's where we get the accuracy so that's what uh, we are doing out here so let's follow through the slides very quickly uh, after reading the examples, uh, the MNIST data set, we will get 55,000 examples in the training set, 5,000 validation, test is 10,000. Uh, we have gone through this, adding the placeholders, adding the variables, getting the logits, uh, getting the loss function, which in this case is uh, tf.nn.softmax cross entropy with logits. And uh, we get the optimizer. We are using the basic gradient descent optimizer with a learning rate, uh, which was a parameter out there. We keep on training and uh, we will get an accurate, if we run our model, our accuracy goes to 90%, which is not very high because we are using a linear model, a very simple linear model. And as we go along, we'll see that uh, there are much more powerful models like uh, convolution, uh, convolutions that we can use, convolution layers to get way higher accuracies on, on the MNIST. If you look at the TensorBoard, you can look at all the dependencies out here, the gradient descent, uh, that optimizer depends on the gradients, which is kind of hidden, Tensor, uh, TensorFlow automatically calculates it. And uh, this is directly dependent on the on the weights right the weights and the biases that we uh, that we defined so that's that and uh, in the next lectures uh, we are going to be looking at uh, word to work thanks a lot